Hi, everybody. Thank you again. If you're just joining us for Super Science Saturday brought to you by NCAR and UCAR Science Education Centers. We are going into our next event. And again, every 30 minutes, we're going to have an awesome science show. And next up, we're going to travel through time and we're going to think about the physics of a medieval trebuchet. By the end of this event, you'll be able to say trebuchet as well. So I'm going to send it over to Carl Drews. And as always, you're welcome to ask us any questions um, throughout this event using the Slido platform. And we'll answer them as soon as we come back into 2020. But let's go to Carl Drews and we'll take it, take, take this, take it on. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Super Science Saturday. My wizard persona is Zeus, the god of thunder. And my hair here looks like a cumulonimbus cloud. And lightning comes out of cumulonimbus clouds and hail like you saw earlier and rain, but I've turned it off for this demo so I don't scare all the mortals that are nearby. Now we mentioned we have a special treat for you today. We have a little time machine and we're going to go back in time to the, we're going to go back seven centuries to show you how the principles of physics were used to attack a Scottish castle. We're going to go back to the Scotland and the Scottish Wars of Independence. So let's roll that videotape. Here we go. Welcome to the year 1304. I am Edward I, King of England. And I have come to Scotland because the rebellious and proud Scots are rejecting my rule. I am laying siege to Stirling Castle with my mighty siege engine, using the principles of weight and counterweight and physics to destroy the castle. Behold, the siege engine known as the trebuchet. I've christened this one the War Wolf. It is 300 feet high, and in its pouch, it carries a 300 pound rock. It's designed on the principle of weight and counterweight. This long arm here, with a comparatively light weight, is balanced against the short end of the arm here with a heavy weight. When this is released, this drops, this raises up, and the 300 pound rock flies into the air and smashes the Scots in their redoubt of Stirling Castle. The war wolf took me 50 master carpenters and three months to build. I am ready to show the Scots the might of my fist. All is now ready. Release the war wolf! Your Majesty, they're coming out of the castle. They want to surrender. What? What? They, 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 they can't surrender. I spent three months building this war wolf, but I'm going to use it. Send them back to their castle. They will feel the might of King Edward. Release the war wolf! They've surrendered again, my lord. Very well. I accept their surrender. Well, that king was pretty uptight, wasn't he? Never mind. I am Zeus, god of thunder, lord of the sky, and I'm all about science. Let's take a look at King Edward's trebuchet, shall we? I think he was prone to exaggeration. Well, this baby is about two, three feet high and has a short arm here with a heavy weight, balancing a long arm with a much lighter weight, 300 pounds, he said. So this is the rock that goes in there. And what happens is normally this is in balance, but when this weight is heavy and this one is lighter, it will fly up and fling over the projectile over the top toward the castle. Let's give it a shot. Trigger mechanism is kind of tricky, but we hold it back like this and let her go. Not bad for medieval times. 
Let's try that in slow motion. Like you said, and again. The trigger mechanism for a trebuchet is kind of tricky. It consists of a pouch here on the end of a long string or rope, and it attaches to the end of the arm like this. It's pulled back at a sharp angle, but when the trigger releases, the weight swings out and unhooks from the arm, throwing the projectile out toward the castle. The problem is that this release point here is kind of tricky. In fact, the last use of a trebuchet in siege warfare was in 1521 when Cortez was besieging Mexico City. They released the arm of the trebuchet. It swung, pouch swung out and released just as planned. Then the projectile flew straight up into the air and came down smash and destroyed their trebuchet. And that was the final use of a trebuchet in siege warfare. And that is how the principles of physics with weight and counterweight were used in medieval siege warfare. I'm Zeus. Great to see you at Super Science Saturday. That was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the year 2020. And thank you for the memorabilia that you brought me, our writing utensil of the times. I appreciate oh, yes. that. It's good to be back, yes. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, Lorena, that surrender really was refused. The Scots in the castle saw King Edward building this huge trebuchet and maybe taking a couple practice shots toward their castle with these big boulders. And so they got scared and said, we're done, we're coming out. And he sent them back to the castle saying, no, I'm refusing it, I wanna try this thing out. So that really did happen. And after he had destroyed the castle curtain wall, then he finally accepted the surrender. And I guess if there's any lesson for us today in that refusal of surrender is that we get very excited about our research and our science and the things that we're doing. And we love what we do and we like to see it in action. And so you'll see that, you already saw that in the demo earlier and you'll see that in the rest of the demos throughout the day. Yeah, it's so cool to see that, you know, there's scientists that were in the field, you know, with this catapult like a lot of the the weight and counterweight like mm -hmm. you don't have to be inside the laboratory with like goggles and beakers you can actually do science with pieces from a hardware store yes you could build nowadays this, <laughs> you could build this this catapult at at home with like you said pieces from a hardware store i'll i'll bring it up here and i'll show you kind of a close-up view of it and show the parts of this that's awesome i'm so excited have you ever seen this trebuchet in action? Maybe you've seen it in cartoons, but it's actually historical, which is amazing. Yes. So there's a principle of torque, which is the twisting power here. So if I'm pulling on a short arm here, a short level, I have to push real hard. If I'm pushing on a long arm, I don't nearly have to push as hard. So the big rock here pushes against the lightweight over on this side and flings it over the top. Now, there's a story about Archimedes who said that if you give me a lever long enough and a place to stand, I can move the earth. So if we extend this principle, here's the earth over here on this side. Here's Archimedes. And he's over here giving it all he's got and he's pushing and pushing. And sure enough, if he moves the lever a lot, the earth moves. Now, there's a problem he never thought of is if there's an earthquake and the earth moves a lot, then Archimedes is going to go flying off into space and hit the moon just like the trebuchet showed. So you have to watch out for these kind of things, but it's the same principle of angular force, torque, and lever distances. Yeah, and I remember like if I'm thinking of trying to move like 
my toy box. Um, I mm-hmm. can't lift it myself, but if I had like, you know, really sturdy, maybe a broom and my adult at home could help me lift that, that's, that's right. the if torque you, that you're talking about? Yes, that's right. So if you lever it under something, you, you push real hard on it, you'll be able to move something much heavier than you are. Awesome. Mm-hmm. And I don't see that we have any questions yet, but if you okay. are out there and you wonder anything about weight and counterweight and torque, or maybe from where you traveled from in that battle that you just had, like definitely <laughs> let us know. Um, oh, and I'm seeing that we do have a few questions. Okay. Um, awesome. They have appeared. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brett, and everybody who's helping us in multimedia services um, during this Super Science Saturday to make this magic of technology happen. So we have a comment, the first comment, um, where there were some flying shoes that you put these. <laughs> did you actually put them on the catapult? Or yes, was it we, the- put, uh, we put various items on the trebuchet and shot them. It's much better if, the, if something is smaller, so it fits into the pouch. So you have to adjust the pouch. But there are various things in medieval warfare that were catapulted over the city walls, kind of <laughs> insulting things and dangerous things, not just rocks. <laughs> so yes, that, that did happen. You can load anything in and away it goes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let's see. And we have a question from T, um, which is, how big were the real trebuchets? How heavy slash big were the projectiles? Do you have an idea about that? Well, T, I looked up this particular trebuchet was rumored to be 300 feet high, which is very, very high. So that's like a multi-story building, you know, what, maybe 25, 30 stories. So that's very big. And I think that had to be the height of the trebuchet with the arm extended vertically in its rest position. So it's going to be up real high like this. And so that's probably the height there. This one was, it really did take him 50 carpenters and three months to build. And so he, it was something really big. And he threw a 300 pound rock with this thing, which is also very, very heavy. And so when that hits the wall, even a stone wall, thick stone wall, it's gonna destroy it. And the story goes that he destroyed it with just the front of the castle, but just a few shots there. So perhaps as big as 300 feet high um, in its upright position and 300 pound rock. So it's a lot of force. So thanks for that question, T. That's great engineering. And we have Grace who's watching us. So she just wanted to say hi. Hi, Grace. Hi, Grace. Hi, everybody. Good to have you here. And Joe who said, that was awesome. Hold on, how many exclamation points? Awesome. Thank you, Joe. It was really a lot of fun to build this with my son Apollo up on Mount Olympus. Okay, great. And we have a question from Wallace. How do you aim the trebuchet? Wallace, that is the question that was very much on our minds as we put this together. The left to right is not so hard. Just You just aim the thing straight ahead and that's where it's gonna go. But as the weight swings off the arm, you never really know when it's gonna release. So you could throw something straight up in the air or you could slam it to the ground or you could get a nice long shot. And I think what you have to do is do a lot of practice shots with the thing and adjust it and do it, the, launch it the same way every time and you're gonna get something predictable. So this is a principle in general science. If you do things the same way and record exactly how you set things up, you're gonna get repeatable results. And that's where we are most interested in science as being able to understand why we're getting the results we're getting. That's awesome, trial and error. So many boulders that must have like flown through those time frames, through those oh, yes. <laughs> processes. <laughs> and this is an interesting question from Jenna. What countries use the trebuchet the most, do you think? I'm mostly familiar with European history. And so it was used in um, England and in Scotland and in Germany to attack these fortified castles. The Chinese used things like this as well. And the Mongols used them in their invasions. So this is really something throughout the world that's, that's used. It's 
uh, it's very difficult to attack a stone wall with just like spears and your bare hands. So you got to find a way to throw rocks at it, big heavy rocks. And so as long as there were fortified castles, people would come up with these things with various levels of success. The one that Cortez used in Mexico City, it uh, went straight up and destroyed his trebuchet. So not very successful. Wow. Other questions? Yes, we have so many and it's so awesome because everybody's really smart out there and they're, they're really challenging us here. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, that's what we expect. Yes, yeah, so we have a question from Paul and they ask, what type of trebuchets are there? Well, there's, there's three types. There's the one called the ballista, one called a mangonel, and the third one is called the trebuchet. The ballista is basically a giant crossbow. So you set up this um, apparatus. So there is this big bow or big members on the side that bend and you attach a wire or a cable or a rope between them. Then you pull it back with a winch and then you can shoot either a giant arrow or maybe a rock out and shoot it forward and then take maybe 20 minutes to load up the next one. So the speed of a ballista, the, re the refiring speed is not very good, but it can really show something very powerful. Shoot this powerful, like a big, huge arrow out. That's called the ballista. It's a giant crossbow. Second kind is called a mangonel. And that is where you have a arm like this, a rotating arm, and it comes up against a stop. The, it's, it holds the, the ball here or the rock here in a, in a pocket. And then it comes up and goes wham. And then you crank it down again and with a big spring or ropes and then load it again and wham. And it throws the projectile out toward the castle that way. So that's called a mangonel that uses stored energy. The trebuchet is really the most powerful because you can make it as big as you can think of. And this huge weight on top is the counterweight and then throw something out this way. It also has the advantage is, is the arm doesn't come up against the stop, wham, which is probably gonna break your catapult. So this thing just sort of throws it smoothly, uses a lot of the energy of the dropping weight and launches it out. So when you get to high school, there's classes you take about in physics where you talk about kinetic energy and potential energy, and there's a trade-off between potential, potential energy and kinetic energy, just like this, throwing something out that way. So those are the three types, a ballista, mangonel, and a trebuchet. That's so awesome. And it seems like each of them have their own like speciality. So if something was flying in the air, assuming we had dragons in this world, I feel like the ballista would probably do the most, um, you know, up in the sky shooting yeah. of arrows. I think the ballista would be the easiest to aim. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank <laughs> you. And then we have Rue who said, cool. Like, this Thank is you, so Rue. <laughs> Let's see. Checho, Kai, and Amaya. Is it easy to make the trebuchets? I will show you how some of the things are made. I thought it was pretty easy, but you have to think out what you're doing first of all and, and plan how you're gonna have the force there. So this one here is made out of one by twos that Apollo and I bought at a hardware store. And then there's some braces on the sides. And this pouch here kind of looks like a face mask, but this is an actual pouch. And as long as you have a big heavy weight, this is what we use for a heavy weight. Does everybody have a sledgehammer head at home? I'm sure you do. You know, you've got a couple of these lying around. So that's a heavy weight that you can use and just kind of put it all together. Get your mom and dad working with you and you can make something like this and have some fun in your backyard. Awesome. So any adult at home with the, you know, um, that you trust can definitely help you to make that. That's awesome. Sure. sure. <laughs> And then we do have a question that's related to um, the trebuchets real quick before we get to a question that might be mm -hmm. more of a science outside of um, what we're doing right now. But from Faye, are there still any trebuchets in any historical place or are there any remaining? At Stirling Castle, if you go to Scotland, Stirling Castle has been repaired since Edward broke it and it is still a visitable place to this day. So if you go to Stirling, Stirling Castle, the castle is there and they have a replica of the war wolf trebuchet there as well. And so I don't know whether they throw stones every week, every month, or they just let it sit, 
but they do have a replica of this. So you can look at this and see how big it was in front of you and see this thing. And um, so yes, this is definitely a, a, a replica there in the historical place. There are some others as well. People build these things because they're a lot of fun and they're also dangerous because they're very powerful. So people, people do build these and do historical reconstructions and you can find them in various places, probably in the United States as well. That's so awesome. And because everybody's kind of staying at home, there are a lot of things online that hopefully you can explore all the pictures, maybe Google um, can help you or any other platform of web searches um, until we get to travel again. Mm -hmm. Unless you're traveling through time like you are, Carl. In which well, case, that's a lot easier. <laughs> you just go right where you want and the, the, everything's all set up for you. Yeah, in our time frame, we, we, it must have gotten lost, but we, we don't have that machine yet here. <laughs> okay, let's go to one that's about salinity of water. And it might not be a question that you could answer, but, you know, maybe somebody else throughout the day or um, any other scientists as they go through Super Science Saturday might be able to answer. So the, the, this is from Shamini Nath from India. Thank you for joining us. They say, hello, ma'am and sir. Good morning. I have a question. How does pressure affect what, how does pressure affect um, seawater salinity? And how does salinity react when the depth is changed? Hmm. I'll tell you what, I'll just address the, uh, the fact of salinity. Salinity makes seawater heavier because uh, salt water is heavier. So when you have a part, of, a part of the ocean that has a lot of salt in it, it will sink under the fresh water. For example, the Mediterranean Sea is very salty because a lot of evaporation happens there. And so the water gets very salty. And so when that pours out on, through the Strait of Gibraltar and out into the Atlantic Ocean, that heavy salty water goes down on the bottom and slides underneath the fresh water on top. And so at the Straits of Gibraltar, you get this exchange where there is salt water coming out on the bottom and fresh water coming in on the top. So that's something that we notice in various places with salt water and that, that it is heavier and more dense. So it sits underneath the fresh water. Now, temperature also makes a difference. Hot water is, expands a little bit and is lighter. So if there's a combination of heat and of warm water and cool water and salt and fresh water, it gets really complicated. And we call that thermohaline circulation, where it's based both on salt and on temperature. Thank you so much for taking a crack at that. And it's really cool to hear about how different temperatures and how salt water is a lot heavier. So how temperature affects it as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And again, from Shamini and Nath from India, we, it's not a question, but rather a comment. Sir, it's a great pleasure to meet you. I am one of the regular followers of the NCAR activities. All programs are really appreciable and knowledgeable. Thank you. Shamini, it's great to have you here. We're really happy that you're watching us this morning or whatever time it is in India. Great. And we are coming close to the hour, which is gonna be close to the next event. But one real quick question, if you can answer um, pretty quickly is um, from Chechokai and Amaya, how fast can a trebuchet fling a rock? Well, Apollo and I calculated how fast it could um, throw the golf ball that we are experimenting with. And it was a, a few meters per second, which was enough to throw it about maybe 10, 15 feet or so. You could probably calculate that Edward stood off maybe a quarter mile from Sterling Castle and threw rocks all that way. And so using some of the principles that you learn in high school physics class, if you know how far something travels and how far it's thrown, you can calculate the speed. So they probably didn't have a way to measure that, but yes, it can throw it fast enough to get it about a quarter mile in the distance. So I'll, I'll just <laughs> stop with that. Awesome, thank you. And I'm sure it has to do with the different size, how long the arm is. So if anybody mm -hmm. out there ends up making a trebuchet on your own, it's definitely a great science project. You can make oh, yeah. an Excel spreadsheet, use MATLAB, anything you, um, that will help you track that um, average speed for your own trebuchet. Well, thank you so much, Carl, for coming to the year 2020 to share with us um, some historical information. I mean, it's, it's historical for us, of course, um, information about the trebuchets. And I look forward to continuing to see what is out there in the world of history and science. 
good to have you with good to have be with you Lorena thank you for having me and bye bye everyone enjoy the rest of the presentations thank you everybody for joining us